Well, good morning. So before I get started this morning, I'd like to introduce you a little bit to the gentleman whose video that we just watched. Um, his name is uh, Jay Sheedy, and he's from England. And I came across him several months ago um, and really found him to be very inspirational. He has a way of taking a concept um, that's really in depth and breaking it down into three or four minutes. And this is part of his mission um, is to bring these messages and ideas to millennials. So he does them in such a way that it actually reaches them. And I'm far from being a millennial and I still get something from it, which is why I chose to share it with you. Um, and Jay was actually born in, in London and he went to school there and he was uh, considered to be a rather nerdy and troublesome child. Um, and after he graduated from college with a master's in business, he decided he didn't want to do any of that. So he became a Buddhist monk and lived that life for about three to four years, traveling throughout Europe and India, um, sharing these messages and starting to teach people. And what's really funny, and I couldn't find it in his bio, but I found it in one of his videos, he was invited to not be a monk. <laughs> and the reason was is his teachers all said that he, he would do so much more work outside of that, that there were so many more people that he could reach and touch. So he became a social media expert and bringing these messages to platforms like YouTube and Twitter and things like that. So I just find them very interesting. You saw one of his videos last week. Um, I, when I ran across this one, the FOMO or JOMO, I thought, wow, this is going to be a great topic. Little did I know how difficult it was going to be. <laughs> but if, you, if you're ever looking for moments of inspiration, I highly recommend that you check out some of his videos. They're short, um, they're entertaining, and honestly, they, they kind of reach a level that a lot of the inspirational speakers don't get to. Uh, he's less about yelling and more about just getting you into that groove and hearing it. So I absolutely recommend it. And on that note, as we talked about social media experts and things like that, I'm going to start this morning talking about technology. Most of you here know that I am a huge fan of technology. Um, I, I find that when used properly, technology frees up our time. It frees up um, a lot of the mundane things that we do. We don't have to sit there and you know hand write out everything. And it's supposed to make our lives easier. That was what we were told about technology. And in many cases, I think that still holds true. But I think technology has also become very burdensome. So, there's a famous saying, which a lot of people say all the time, and not everybody actually recognizes the fact that it was a Bible verse. And what we hear repeated a lot is money is the root of all evil. I, no matter where you go, you will hear that phrase. The actual full verse, when not taken out of context, comes from Timothy, and it reads, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So when I thought about this, when we look at the short version, money is the root of all evil, basically that's a very judgmental comment. Uh, it's judgmental of others and it's judgmental of ourselves. But when we take the full version and put it back into context, we realize that it is that love of and that pursuit of money. And when it becomes more important than anything else, that love, that pursuit actually obstructs our line of sight and our connection to one another and to source. So getting back to technology, one of the great things about technology is the fact it has made our planet smaller. We used to be in a great big world. To give you an idea of how big the planet used to be, in the 1800s, it would take five to six months to travel from the East Coast to the West Coast in a covered wagon. Okay. Today, 
you can fly from Los Angeles to Tokyo in 13 to 14 hours, which is a distance of 5,477 miles. That's a long way. In that covered wagon, depending on the weather, the terrain, and the health of the people that were traveling, they'd be lucky to travel 5 to 20 miles a day. Now, I drive 13 miles every morning to work, door to door. And I do it in about half an hour to an hour. So what I do in a half an hour to an hour, it would take them anywhere from a day to three days to travel that. That sort of illustrates how our world got smaller. Another thing I found interesting is in the 1700s, this was actually scary. In the 1700s, it would take six weeks to three months to cross the Atlantic between England and the Americas. They never knew if they had enough food on board. Because there was no, and that's a huge difference. Six weeks, three months? How do you plan for that one? With the advent of technology in our travel, we actually made the world smaller. But when the world was bigger, cultures were very diverse. We think of diversity in, in cultures across the globe as, well, they're very different between here and Japan. But it really, honestly, used to be even regional. Uh, you think back uh, in the late 1700s, early, 16, uh, early 1800s, the difference between the North and the South. And that's right here in our own country. Distinctive fashion, distinctive beliefs. We were all one country, and you'd say, okay, so we're one culture, but we weren't. Cities had different identities. They had different customs that each applied to their own area. Well, as the world got smaller, all these things started meshing and becoming very, uh, very similar, very common. With the invention of the telegraph, the radio, and the television, the world shrank even more. Because now, with these inventions, ideas could be shared within a matter of hours and days rather than weeks, months, and decades. And then came the invention of the internet and social media. Now, the internet has a lot of good qualities. I'm not here to tell you that it's all negative, because it's not. However, gossip and misinformation could never have dreamed of a better partner than the internet and social media. And part of the reason for that is the fact that it is so easy today to share an idea, and it's instantly available. I can go home right now, write a post about this morning, and as soon as I hit send, if I had followers on the other side of the world, they would see it. They would know it right then and there. There's no delays. There's no time for people to digest and understand this. What I also find interesting is with the explosion of the internet and social media, we've also seen a huge, huge increase in global dissatisfaction with our own lives. And it's, it's across the globe. Uh, you see more and more people dissatisfied with the life they're living as the world grew smaller. And one of the main reasons for that is we are comparing our lives to the images that we see from not only our friends and family, but from complete strangers that we don't even know. Uh, there's a phenomenon on both YouTube and Facebook. It's called influencers. And they get lots of followers just because. They have no real message. They're just living. And what they're showing is the ideal, perfect life. Unfortunately, what they're finding is these people aren't living these ideal lives. Uh, of, in a world of selfies, and you see all these perfect selfies and the best angle and the right lighting. Well, for every good selfie, there's probably about 200 that didn't turn out right. Okay, uh, I actually came across uh, one person who did an experiment and he wanted to see if he could truly become a social media influencer. So he staged all of these things. 
um, private uh, jets, uh, great vacations, uh, certain shopping trips, things like that, all from his own living room using uh, blue screens and photoshopping. And he had well over five million people following him simply because he looked like he was living that fantastic life. So kind of keeping in tune with information, because I like to share it. In the 1980s, and I'm going to pick the 80s because this is when I became more self-aware of a world outside of my own family. A term that was very popular, it may have been beforehand, I know some people still use it now, but it was keeping up with the Joneses. Okay. Back then in the 80s, keeping up with the Joneses was more of a local sphere of influence. And it really, it was, my neighbor just bought X, well, I have to get X and better. And then you get better X, and neighbor over here says, well, I'm not going to be outdone, so I'm going to go get an even better X than what my neighbor just got. And it created this cycle. And what was happening is everybody was trying to keep up with everybody else. And in the process, digging themselves dig deeper and deeper into debt. However, nobody actually recognized, noticed, or cared that everybody was going into debt. You may have been going to debt because you're just trying to keep up with everything, but in your mind, your neighbors were perfect. They didn't have financial problems. They weren't having issues with their family. On the outside, everything looked beautiful. And that was the life we wanted, so that was the life that we were going for. But it just created this cycle that kept going on and on and on. With the internet and social media, the Joneses have now moved from being local and being our next door neighbors to being global. And the comparisons are even greater. One of the things that strikes me uh, very interesting, in the 80s and 90s when I would watch TV and the news and you would see uh, news clips in other countries, you could actually tell where they were, more or less, by the way that they dressed and by their customs and things like that. You watch the news today, try and figure out where it actually is. Everybody now, globally, almost seems to look the same. We're all wearing the same clothes, the same memes, all of this. It, it's, it's kind of frightening in some ways because I think we're losing some of that cultural diversity that comes with it. And it, I, I just think it's kind of sad that we've lost that, but by the same token, because this information is so easily seen. The internet is available so many places, places that I never would have expected to see what we call Western clothing is now everywhere. Even when I lived in Guatemala, I moved there in the mid 80s and lived there in the early 90s, and it was very rare to see people dress like we are. I mean, yes, they dressed, and they weren't all wearing their you know typical um, uh, ceremonial things, but their, their attire was different. And the lower, the lower in the economic level that they were, the more towards their indigenous dresses that they wore. Today I see, I get pictures coming back from Guatemala all the time, and it's showing kids, and they might as well be here in Corona. That's, that's just how they look. So we've kind of lost sight of that. Social media, what it did is it's allowing us to see other people's lives, and what we see is they're happy. They're always partying. Uh, their relationships are iconic. They're just perfect. And we're comparing our lives. We get up in the morning. We do what we have to do. We go to work. You raise your children. You do the best that you can. And every single day just feels a little bit more like a struggle. And then you see these lives, and you think, What's wrong with me? Why don't I fit in? It's just like you're standing outside of a restaurant, staring into a big window, and everybody's having the greatest meal of their life, and you're outside and you can't get there. And so we start to feel less than who we really should be. And it creates that sense of that fear of missing out. So what do we do? We make decisions that are not always in our best interest. 
in order to keep up with the Joneses, the Garcias, the whatever other name you want to give to them, we start doing things that we wouldn't ordinarily do, things that we're not interested in doing. Um, it creates mental and physical breakdowns. It creates spiritual confusion because we're not looking at our own lives. We're looking at everybody else's. <clears throat> One of the areas that I see this in a lot is also in personal relationships, particularly with our spouses or significant others. It's easy to measure our significant other against this perfect picture that's out there. But I don't know about you, but I don't believe that perfect picture actually exists. We're all human. Everybody feels and thinks things differently. But it's not just social media, and so I don't want to make it sound like it is, because there's a lot of people that aren't on social media, yet they still fall prey to this exact same thing with that whole fear of missing out. Whether you get it from uh, social media, or you get it from reading books, you see it in magazines, movies, and televisions, we are being told who we should be. Not who we are, who we should be. And it's creating this level that's almost impossible to reach. And that level of perfection, that perfect life, based on what the media, based on what movies and television tell us, is not really obtainable. I mean, I love a good love story, but quite frankly, I've seen enough of those uh, in movies to know that's not real life. You know, I'm not going to run to the top of some building in Seattle and find my true love. I found my true love in the most different place in the world. And it was not in a, um, a skyscraper in Seattle. Those movies make us feel good, but what they also do is if we don't separate ourselves from that and look at who we are and what we want in life, people are now beginning to want that epic relationship. I'm going to keep going back to YouTube because I, I climb down this rabbit hole all the time. One of these big trends right now is epic proposals. You know, everybody's trying to outdo everybody else in these wedding proposals. Gone are the days where you just, you know, found somebody you loved and you asked them to marry you. If you got down on one knee, wow, that was romantic. Now we have to have flash mobs and we have to have, you know, 500 people helping uh, to make this moment, you know, spectacular because it's not an engagement if the woman wasn't, if her breath wasn't taken away. Um, it's just, and we, we've got this. And then weddings. Weddings are no longer just simple because we have all these shows that tell us what the perfect wedding should look like. So what are people doing? They're spending thousands tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars for these epic weddings that if they're lucky, they'll actually remember. You know? <laughs> it, that wedding has now uh, gone from being, uh, this is a show of our commitment to each other, to this is us showing you how perfect we are. And we want you to know how perfect we are so that you can feel less about yourself. And I don't think that's what they're thinking. I, I really don't think that's what they're thinking. But a lot of the their participants, the attendees, they're feeling that. You know, they're sitting there going, well, I didn't have, you know, uh, live singers at my, my wedding. Um, I didn't have a celebrity come and, and serenade my wife during the first dance. I didn't create this epic first dance that had me twirling in the air from the ceiling. You get all of these things, and it's because we are bombarded by this perfect image of what life is. But when we measure our lives against others, it's going to make ours seem dull, because nobody's actually living these great lives. It's going to be, uh, appear to be boring and harder than everyone else. Fear of missing out leads us to make some very unfortunate choices for the wrong reasons. Um, I believe this is one of the reasons why we're seeing a increase in substance abuses, um, in the party drugs, and in a lot of the drinking, is because in order to be able to 
have that fun that everybody's having, you have to separate yourself from who you are to be in that space. And some people, the only way they can do that is through uh, those substances. So it actually, through the fear of missing out, it leads them to do things that they ordinarily would not do for themselves. On the flip side of that is the joy of missing out. Now, this term of uh, joy of missing out, it can be very liberating, but it's also very misleading. Because when you hear the word missing out, you're thinking, well, how can that be joyful? Well, it's joyful because you are embracing your life for what it is, not being measured by others. You're not, being, you're not doing what other people tell you you should do. You're doing maybe things that people have told you you shouldn't do. So we get rid of that whole should and shouldn't. We get rid of that whole judgment and that measurement from other people. Now, I'm absolutely not saying not to have dreams. Anybody who knows me knows I'm definitely not saying that. I'm not saying not to have goals. And I'm also not saying to not change your life if you desire to do so. What I am saying is to make those changes if it feels right for you, not because somebody told you you should. You want to look at everything in your life and see how it feels to you, not how it presents to somebody else, not how they feel about it. How do you feel? That is when you start embracing that joy of missing out because, quite frankly, if you go at it from that angle, you're not going to make those unfortunate choices that are going to create even more problems for you. So the joy of missing out is missing out on that misery that comes uh, as an auto, almost an automatic uh, result from the fear of missing out. So another area that for me is very important, it's one I've struggled with for a good portion of my life, and that's to stop basing your spiritual progress and path on someone else's. Now this happens because we find inspirational teachers, inspirational books, things like that. And when they speak, we're like, yes, that sounds so great. And then we find out that they're not quite as perfect as we thought that they should be. And I underline that word should be. And what a lot of people tend to do is they come across that and they go, well, they're a fraud. They don't live their life. So let me ask you this question. How often in your life have you given some of the greatest advice to other people about any subject? And then when that same situation happened to you, you couldn't even take your own advice. Okay. Just because somebody is, does not necessarily live their life the way you think that they should does not mean that the inspiration that you got from them is no longer valid. You don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Okay? You take the good pieces and you keep them. Maybe what you find out about this person is somebody you, you don't want them in your life, but you still learn something from them. They still inspired you to move forward, to do different things in life. When you're with other people, and, and Jay talked about this in his video, when you're with other people, be present. Truly listen to what they're saying. Don't judge them for what they're saying. Don't try and catch them in a lie. Don't try and compare your life to theirs, whether you want to make yours better or worse. Listen to them. Make a genuine connection. Because here's the thing. We become so accustomed to people actually really, for the most part, not caring what we have to say that not only do we believe they're not listening to us, we're also not listening to them. We're constantly sitting there figuring out, well, how can uh, what I'm going through, how can I make that sound so much worse than what they're going through? Or how can I make my life seem so much better than theirs? So simply stop comparing. It's not a competition. Allow a person to express 
themselves in how they show up. And definitely put down the phone. Put down the phone and engage on a human level. It's, it is scary how often, um, and, and I used to say it was just millennials, but quite frankly, um, I go out enough, I'm out in public enough, I see it. It's kind of an epidemic. I see people from all age groups that are glued to their phones. It's really sad when I go to restaurants and I see you know, a family or I see a husband and wife out at a restaurant and they're both sitting there on their phone. And of course, from the financial standpoint, my brain's going, why are you here? Why are you spending money? And if you don't wanna be with this person, why not just stay home, you know? But we are, we are so afraid we're gonna miss something. We're gonna miss uh, what the latest score is. We're gonna miss the latest political uh, change that's happened. We're gonna miss that our sister-in-law uh, just had you know, um, prime rib. I mean, it really, <laughs> when, when you think of some of the things that, that go through there, in the, the whole epidemic of people not even being able to drive without texting, what is so important Truly, what is so important that you have got to, between point A and point B to be texting? You know what that actually tells me? They don't want to be alone. They're not even comfortable with themselves. So this interaction, regardless of how mundane it is, this interaction actually keeps them from being in their own head, which is exactly where we need to be. We need to be present in that moment. So when you're with people, stop interpreting what they say based on what you believe and what you feel. That's a really hard one for me. Now, the truth of the matter is some people are gonna lie to us. Now they're gonna do this for a couple of reasons. One, some of them lie to us simply because of their fear of missing out, so they wanna make their life seem better or worse, or they need that attention. That's just a fact of life. It's part of their current path and where they are right now. Some people are gonna lie to you because they really just don't know who they are or what their truth is. They have allowed society, social media, their families, all of these people to tell them who they should be and they haven't taken the time to figure it out themselves. So that lie is not really a lie, it's they just don't know. So rather than judge others, let's listen, let's be engaged, and show some interest. Now you have the right, you have the obligation to choose what you want in your life. So you don't have to, if somebody is constantly lying to you, you don't have to constantly let that person stay there. So you have that right. What you don't have the right for is to tell them who they should be. You don't have the right to expect them to change. Your choice is, can I accept this? Do I want this in my life or not? Not how can I change them? One of the areas that we start that with, I go back to this all the time, is you start with your spouse. You know, we, we tend to and I, and I do say this generally, because I know not everybody does it, but I think a great majority do. It's, I don't like this about you, so I'm gonna change you to be more like me, okay? Um, one of the, the areas that comes to mind, years ago I had a, a very close friend. She was a very dear, dear friend to me. And she had the absolute hardest time having any romantic relationships. I mean, she, she was a beautiful soul, she was loving, she was outgoing, she was giving, but she had a flaw. And at the time, I really pictured it as a major flaw. I was very judgmental of her. She was the kind of person who was extremely expressive in her feelings. If she felt something, she shared it. And in her relationships, she demanded that her partners be the same. And when they weren't, she felt they were hiding things from her. So she had a tendency to be attracted to people 
who were exactly the opposite of her. So <laughs> she was an extremely um, extroverted personality, sharing everything. And all these people that she became romantically involved with were quiet, shy introverts. You know, small things like, so how was work today? Fine. Well, what are you hiding from me? Okay, that's how that would go. So she went through relationship after relationship after relationship. And it was because she wanted them to be just like her. Well, we can't make people like ourselves. We can accept them. We can do the things that they need to do and just kind of let it go in that direction. So to wrap it up, <laughs> when we're talking about the joy of missing out, here's some things just to remember. Be present to others and to yourself. We're going to measure our lives to no one but ourselves. We're not going to measure it against anybody else. Make course corrections because you want to change, not because you have to. The joy of missing out means the joy of being yourself, growing in your own direction at your own pace, and being without, just being without measuring yourself against others. So look at your life. Are you living the, with the fear of missing out or with the joy of missing out? Which life would you like to live? Because the choice is yours and yours alone. So this week, I invite you to practice the joy of missing out. Try it on for size. See how it fits. Chances are you've already tried the fear of missing out, so it can't hurt to try the joy. And with that, the divine in me recognizes the divine in you. Peace be with you. Thank you.